Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee, and by thee be happy in through Christ our Lord. Amen. Virgin most pure, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, so this conference is on detachment, but in order to know what detachment is, you have to know what an attachment is. Okay, so an attachment is a certain quality of giving the metaphysical definition. It's a quality in a faculty by which that faculty is fixed to incline towards an object in a specific way and to a specific degree. Okay. Okay, conference over. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so and, uh, there's, and it's, so an attachment is this fixed, where the thing is like focused on the thing or fixed on the thing, and it has, and the way we know we have an attachment is, is that it's hard to pull away from the thing, right? Whereas in detachment, a person can kind of take it or leave it. So the attachment is, is that the faculty is focused, and, and, and attachments are in four faculties. So the first is in the concupiscible appetite, Concupiscible appetite. And this is the appetite which desires bodily good, like food and matters that pertain to the sixth commandment. So this is, and it's inclined towards these things. So uh, if you ask a woman who is very fond of chocolate, do you like chocolate? So the way you know that you have an attachment is that there is a certain like of it, which is different from being able to appreciate it, right? You can appreciate something. But when you say you like something, it means there's an inclination to that is towards the thing um, in a way that is not perfect. It's not a moderate. Because again, we should be able to take it or leave a particular crazy thing. So do you like chocolate? Oh yeah, I really like chocolate. So, and how can you tell she likes chocolate? You wave it in front of her and then the next thing you know, she's following you around. Right? <laughs> so an attachment, that's why I always tell people, attachment is like the dog with the rag. You've heard this before, but they, that's the dog with the rag. You wave it in front of it and it clamps down on the rag, and then you can drag him anywhere you want, right? Because he's not going to give up on the, on the, I think, which is a sign that the dog has attachments. <laughs> All right, so, um, but it's in the concupiscible appetite, and it means there's a particular thing they like. Detachment in the concupiscible appetite is basically going to mean it doesn't matter what you eat. It doesn't matter, right? Because you can, you know, whatever is put in front of you. In fact, there was one saint, I can't remember which, who he was, but <laughs> as a joke, they, they fed him this stuff that was like, really impalatable, completely raw, and it was just like the normal person wouldn't be able to gag it down. He was just eating it without even really reflecting <laughs> on it, right? Okay. So it's something that can kind of take or leave, right? So the next one is in the irascible appetite, and that's the one that has the emotions, especially in relationship to anger and things of that sort. So the person who is detached in, in their irascible appetite is detached from the vindication, right? Uh, from the vindication of getting, you know, of beating the person up so they stop affecting you, etc. Okay. And then the next is in the intellect. And this basically means we can have an intellectual attachment in the sense of we can actually get a certain pleasure in our intellect about thinking things in a certain way. So we can actually get attachments, not just repetitively, that is in our emotions and our will, but even in our intellect to our own opinions, right? Intellectual pride is ultimately an attachment to one's own intellectual prowess, right? They think they're really good at it. So um, one time when I was teaching the tract on tradition, uh, the first... Uh, Whenever I'd start the tract, I would always start with a 45-minute beating of the seminarians. And the way I would do it is I would say, if you think you're a traditionalist, if you th think X, and you think you're a traditionalist, well, you're not. And then I would quote a source indicating that that's not what the tradition was. And I said, oh, by the way, and if you think Y, and you think you're a traditionalist, oh, by the way, and then I quote another source. And I did this for 45 minutes. And the point was, is to get them to realize that if they really want to adhere to the tradition, they got to give up all their intellectual attachments about what they want to think about the thing and actually adhere to the thing. Okay. So intellectual attachments are when people, you know, they can't, they can't let loose of some thought or they can't let loose of the thing that they want intellectually. You know, they, 
And the way you see this, uh, the attachments in this particular way, so it's again, it's a fixedness, it has to be this way, is their inability to see the fact that, that you know, there can be something that's true, and then you can have other things that are true, they don't contradict each other, but it can be done like, for example, doing certain things in certain ways, they think, no, it can only, you know, because of the way they think, they said it can only be done X, Y, you know, it can only be done this way, not any other way. Okay, the next is in the will, and this is when the will is inclined towards specific things. And that's where you usually see the attachments. The, that and in the concubus of side is where you tend to see them the most. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So an attachment then is this thing that's it's a habit, basically. It's a vice in the faculty inclining it towards something specific. <coughs> There's a specific object inclined towards. And it, can't, it has a hard time letting loose of the thing because it's an attachment, which means it's fixed on it. Okay, this is, you know, we kind of talked about when you're a young child, that's necessary to be in the beginning to give that focus and direction. But at a certain stage, the intellect and will under the guidance of, re of, of, um, of the faith has to redirect the faculties in a more perfected way, which means that we recognize through faith that these things cannot be that which we are fundamentally ordered towards. So... We're inclined towards them maybe by the natural law, but that inclination has to be able to be moderated so that we can take it or leave it. The St. Thomas has that fantastic line where he says that faith is the first purification of the intellect. Because what it does is, is, and he talks a little bit about this also in relationship to fear of the Lord, that the fear of the Lord, faith gives an instant, you know, when we have the faith, there's a certain amount of fear of the Lord because of the fact that you realize you owe him something, and there has to be a proper way to reproach him. But he says it's the first purification of the intellect primarily because of the fact that it changes our perspective on ourselves as the center of the universe, realizing that, no, actually God is the center of the universe, and so it purifies our understanding of other created things. Okay. So that's what an attachment is. What's detachment? Detachment is sometimes called holy indifference. Uh, it's an indifference in the sense that in the appetitive faculties, the faculty is indifferent to the thing. doesn't mean it can't appreciate the thing or take delight in the thing when it encounters it, but that it's not fixed on the thing. So, it, you know, if it, and one, again, one of the ways you know that a particular faculty has an attachment is, is A, it's hard to turn away from it, uh, or B, that when you do turn away from it, there's a bit of pain involved in it. Right? So when you have to give something up, then there's a bit of pain involved. Historically, of course, the church and the writers say there's only one thing to which we can have an attachment to ultimately, and that is God. Everything else has to be detached from. We'll talk about that in a bit. So detachment is just turning away from the created object. So the process of detachment is actually the beginning stages of fear of the Lord. Because fear of the Lord is defined as turning away from created things and turning towards God. So in the end, you cannot master fear of the Lord without perfect detachment, which means you're not going to have perfect wisdom or any of the other ones perfectly. Detachment in the sensitive appetites, that's in the concupiscible and the irascible appetite. By the way, the way you overcome attachments is through virtue. So as you gain virtue in the thing, virtue is a strength in relationship to a particular object, which means it can take it or leave it. Whereas when we're fixed on a thing, we're weak in relationship to the thing because it's holding our attention and we can't get away from it. Okay. So in the sensitive appetites, it means that there's no initial inclination. So when I first come across something, so someone puts out a big juicy steak, right? When I come across it, if I have perfect detachment, my concupiscible appetite won't incline one way or another when it sees it. Whereas if I don't, then what happens? I'm like, ooh. Day. Mm -hmm. And then as a male, my brain starts flooding my, uh, it gets flooded with pleasure drugs just looking at it, right? Okay. The point being is, is that there is that no antecedent appetite. There's no antecedent emotion. So the way you know how you have perfect detachment in relationship with concubus full and rapal appetite is that there is no antecedent emotion at all. So one of the ways that you don't have detachment is if there's an antecedent emotion. 
So if there's something that is upsetting you or that it's contrary to what you want or it occurs before you have a chance to really process it, that's a sign that there's an attachment somewhere. So even if it's anger or sorrow or anything else, you have to get down to the root of it. What do you attach to? Find out what that thing is and let loose of it. So, um, and this applies even in relationship to supernatural things. There's only one thing that you have to have that attachment to and that's God, everything else. Even other supernatural things that John of the Cross says how you have to have that detachment from. Detachment is principally in the concupiscible fly appetite with respect to the passion of love or life, you know, again, as I mentioned. So there's, you know, do you like it? Well, I can take it or leave it. It's not where I, you know, I feel like I really want to have it. Mortification comes from the two Latin words mors facere, which means to make dead. That's what they're what it means, okay. So, and the term mortification literally means that you're killing the antecedent life of your passions. You're trying to kill their life independent of reason. That's the goal in mortification. And so mortification, St. Thomas says, is opposite so the concupiscible appetite is attached through love. Mortification is, and love means that you look at the thing and there's a certain, St. Thomas says, in the passion of love, there's a certain consonance when we see it. And by that he means, he says there's a certain complacentia, there's a certain pleasing with the thing when you see it, right? So through mortification, what happens is, is mortification is the opposite. Instead of getting a pleasure out of the thing or thinking about or seeing the thing initially, what happens is, is you kill any of that antecedent pleasure that you're going to gain from the thing. Okay. Doesn't mean you can't take pleasure in it in delight, in the emotion of delight, that, but that has to be from reason recognizing this is good and only to this degree. Okay. So mortification then is that you give the sensible appetite its opposite. Now, the concupiscible appetite, St. Thomas says, primarily deals with pleasure. Right? With matters of food in relationship to matters of the Sixth Commandment. So you do the opposite of that. And as you put, give the faculty its opposite to what it's inclined towards, the faculty retracts from it. So it begins to stop being inclined as a result of that. Okay. So this is how you quiet the concupiscible appetite is through its opposite, which is pain. Right? So literally no pain, no gain. The sad part of it is, is that people today have no ability to turn away from stuff. They want comfort, they want, the, uh, they want to be, uh, have pleasure in all things, basically, and they don't want to have to turn away from it. They don't want to have to engage in the pain. So in other words, if you don't, if you can't master the willingness to suffer, you're never going to master uh, the mortification, obviously. You're never going to master the attachments. You're just going to always be, while well, your attachment is drawn from one place to another. Uh, attachments can affect our judgment. Pretty obviously. Why? If I'm attached to something and then somebody does something against it, then I'm going to get upset, I'm going to get angry as a result of that. Okay. So that means, so, and th what that means then is, is when people act against this thing that I love. So let's just say I come home and father torched my entire library, <laughs> right? And I stand there placidly and think happy thoughts. No. Uh, <laughs> so. The tendency, if I don't have my appetites in control, would be to get angry with him and want to club him over the head for torching my library, right? Not that he would do such a thing. But the point is, is that it's because of that attachment to that that my anger arises. And so that, and once my anger arises, you've heard me talk about this before, then my judgment, which requires my imagination, that that anger gets into my imagination. I experience that anger and I see it in my imagination, and then I tend to think, as St. Thomas says, I tend to think things are worse than they are or better than they are, and so I tend to think that things are worse, and so my punishment tends to be more extreme than it needs to be. The point in all this is, is that the only way you can have perfect judgment, intellectual judgment, putting aside the limitations of our human faculties, is through detachment. So I tell people, look, if, you're, if you've got an antecedent emotion or if, you're, if your head isn't clear about something, the first thing you've got to do is find, this, find if there's any attachments in that area, get rid of the attachments, and then your head will begin to clear. 
about what you need to do or not need to do in relationship to it. Okay. Detachment in the will consists in the will choosing to turn away from the object of attachment by letting loose of it or by not pursuing it, literally turning away and just not going to actually begin to pursue it. So the will, if it's got this attachment, as you turn away from it, it will slowly habituate that and break that attachment, slowly. It's not an instantaneous thing, normally speaking. So it takes a bit of doing. Once you get the intellect and will, once the detachment occurs there where the person's made a choice and they start detaching, that doesn't mean that the concupiscible appetite doesn't have its attachments still. And we all know this from common experience. So, for example, if we really like food, once we go on a diet, okay, I'm going to go on a diet, I'm going to stay this, the food comes around, I'm like, eh, okay, maybe a little bit of this, right? So, in other words, even though the will might have chosen it, the concupiscible appetite is still attached to certain things, okay? And so, it takes time for the lower faculties to, to adjust to reason showing them this is not to be pursued. Uh, any attachment in the lower faculties, in the cubicle appetite or rascal appetite, so if you have any, any antecedent emotion whatsoever, A, it's a sign of lack of virtue. The second thing is there's a concomitant weakness in the will to that thing that you're attached to. You're weak in relationship to it, in the will. And so you have to start strengthening the will and then the detachment will come subsequently to that. And so this is an important point because I think that sometimes that people don't tend to realize that any attachment to anything that's created, anything whatsoever, automatically means there's a weakness somewhere in the will. Okay. So, and that really means that the, the really strong person is the one person is attached to God alone. Overcoming the attachments and the appetites, the first thing that must occur is letting loose on the side of the will, as I mentioned. You have to be let loose of it. Just say, okay, I gotta get, I gotta not hold on to this thing. Uh, mortification, we've talked about how that works. And mortification is also good because it strengthens the will because you have to maintain, you know, like if you're, if you're fasting, you have to maintain the, because your imagination is being affected by your concupiscible appetite and it's thinking about the, the uh, malted milk balls or the whoppers in the refrigerator. Ooh, those malted milk balls are over there, right? Or, or the chocolates over there, that they start clamoring for their object, and the will, intellect and will, have to mean staying focused despite the fact that they want to go eat or do whatever they want to do. So that actually, that, through that mortification, the will becomes stronger, but it, um, it, it helps us to uh, um, keep that focus, strengthen the will so we can keep our focus. This is why it affects prayer, by the way. In mortification and working on detachments, once our lower faculties, like the concupiscible app or absolute appetite, are no longer given their object, and they're used to not getting their object, they're not going to clamor for their object, and so they're not going to be distracting us during our prayer. So a lot of times people complain of distraction, and sometimes it's just because their imagination needs some work, but other times, and their cogitative power, but a lot of times it's the fact that there's some attachment, so doing mortification can actually help your focus in prayer. Ironically, prayer itself can be, though, cause the reverse. It can actually cause a decrease in the attachments for two reasons. The first is you remain focused on the object of prayer. Supernatural objects are not the proper objects of the concupiscible and irascible appetite. So if you're meditating on the Eucharist, you're not thinking to yourself, oh, I just really love the taste of that Eucharist. You're not thinking in terms of, oh, this is going to be really tasty. It's not what you're thinking. Right? You're focusing on it in a different way. Or you're focusing on thing or you're focusing on an object that has nothing to do whatsoever to the lower faculties and as a result of that when they don't get their object they quieten down. At first they kinda of clamor a little bit, but then they learn, hey, this isn't your place. Those are trainable. Okay. The second reason is is that through prayer we begin to see things differently. And when we see them from a different perspective, our emotions, our appetites begin to calm down. And as a result of that, we realize, you know, these things just aren't worth what we think they are. I can let loose of them. Uh, grace can remove attachments. Grace enlightens the mind and strengthens the will. So a grace can actually break an attachment into the intellect and will instantly, if God wants to give it. 
But it doesn't mean that God won't actually be stuck with what's in the concupiscible appetite or rational appetite. It just means that he's going to want you to work on that to gain merit. Okay, so you can pray for the grace of detachment. Um, uh, you can also uh, educate yourself. As I mentioned, faith is the first purification of the intellect. So reading, study, studying things in the area of your attachment will help you to see it in a different way so that you can break the attachment. So, uh, and this also helps kind of confusion in the spiritual life. A lot of times people come they're kind of confused about certain things in their spiritual life and it's because there's usually some attachment somewhere. In the spiritual life, you have to go through the process of detachment, letting loose of there, getting let loose of anything that you're attached to. And there's essentially three goods that you have to break your attachment to. The first is has to do with anything that has to do with the world, and that includes everything from your house, your, your wife, your your husband, your children. Uh, anything whatsoever that's external to you, you have to be able to let loose of in some manner. Okay. And you, in other words, you just basically have to have perfect attachment from these things. We'll talk about, okay, well then, because some people will say, well, wait a minute, if I have perfect attachment from my husband and I have holy indifference, aren't I going to be cold? No, actually it's not. Because we're not Zen Buddhists. You know what a Zen Buddhist is? It's someone who meditates on nothing. All right. Which is what he ends up with, nothing. <laughs> okay, but the point is, is that we detach from everything, we become indifferent to everything, so that as a result of that charity, our heart can be fixed on God alone. St. John of the Cross says, if we have an attachment to anything created or love for anything created, it takes that amount of space up in our heart, and as a result of that, there cannot be perfect charity. So in order to have perfect charity, you have to have detachment. So the first stage is detach, and then start working on charity so that you can actually love God with your whole heart. And through that charity, then, the consequent emotions will be more authentic, more purified, actually more intense, and more consistent. As a result of that, people who have perfected charity and become completely detached from those around them are actually more affectionate, they're kinder, etc. So that's one of the things that people tend to fail to realize. Okay. But on the converse of that is, again, you can't develop perfect charity. You can't become like that without becoming detached. So the first thing you got to do is detach from the world. The second is you have to detach from yourself. And that's one of the hardest things. Okay. When Eve ate the fruit, and we know Adam committed the same sins that Eve did, but when Eve ate the fruit, what happened was is her choice was to choose her own fulfillment in trying to become like a god. She pursued her own good, that is a created good, of becoming something other than the incommunicable good, which is God. She chose herself over God. Lucifer did the same thing. All the demons did the same thing. They chose themselves over God. Now, the problem is, is that we got stuck with that problem because this effect was passed on through original sin. So now we're all self-absorbed to varying degrees. And the more self-absorbed somebody becomes, generally speaking, the more disordered becomes their antecedent appetite. So when you see people who are really angry or people who are getting um, you know, irritated or they're just constantly pursuing certain things in our world, it's really because they want to feed something in themselves. Okay. So then uh, we, that's a problem we get stuck with. So, how do we overcome it? You have to start turning away from yourself. Basically what this means is, is that you have to start turning towards God. God has to be your sole focus. One of the things I often, uh, you might have heard me mention this, but with scrupulous people, I will ask them to describe their problem. And then what they do is they describe their problem. And then I'll ask them, okay, tell me what was the most common word you used in that description. And usually, and it's, yeah, it's me or I, is the most common word that appeared to that whole thing. I said, there's your problem. You've lost your focus. Scrupulosity is, it can be diabolic temptation, but it can also just be a, quite a bit of a misunderstanding where the person is actually thinking they're advancing their spiritual life by trying to root out certain sins or come to clarity about their stuff when all they're doing is focusing on themselves. 
So I tell them, you just quit thinking about yourself and you think about God and he'll solve the problem. So this is uh, an important point because it helps us to realize that we cannot be the focus of the spiritual life. But the self is the, one of the key foundational problems. Even the world and the flesh, even the devil can't have, they, they only have an impact insofar as we are focused on ourselves. Right? If we have no focus on ourselves, we're completely focused on God, then what ends up happening is, is the, um, everything else falls into place. Right? If your focus is entirely God, nothing else has any meaning. Now, ironically, you can't keep your focus completely on God if you're attached to the world. So it's something you have, to, you have to work on. But the self is one of the principal things you have to work on. The last one is you really have to work on detachment from supernatural things other than God. St. John of the Cross, in discussing this, he mentions statues. He said... For example, if I have a statue, a blessed statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary or something else, and I'm really attached to it, then if somebody comes along and bumps it over or something like that and I get upset, that's a sign that I have an attachment and so there's not a perfection. One of the areas that you see this is among the charismatic renewal. They are very attached to what they think they've gotten as far as their spiritual gifts. And one of the ways you can tell it is when you tell them, you look, here, I don't want you using the gift of tongues. They immediately experience a pain in relationship to it. They get upset, and I don't understand why. Or the other thing that you see is, is that once they have it, or they think they have it, then they think it's legitimate for them to impose it on you because they say, I got this gift from God. Therefore, because it's from God, you must submit to it now. You kneel down and all impose hands. I don't think so. Right? And this is one of the sites, because the minute you tell them, no, you can't use your gift, your gift here, then they get all upset about it, and that's a sign that they're attached to something that is supernatural, and really usually it's just an attachment to the consolations. You can't be attached even to the consolations that you get throughout the course of your spiritual life. So anything supernatural can't be your focus either. Now this is a pretty important point because St. Thomas says in the there's three stages of the interior life, there's the beginners, the proficients, and the perfect. And he says in the proficient stage, our focus tends to be the fact that we kind of like what this virtue is doing to us. And so it's a sign that we haven't perfectly detached. He doesn't say this, but he says they haven't reached perfection where they're doing everything only for God's sake, which is the stage of the perfect. And so in that intermediate stage, there is a bit of attachment to the, what it's doing to our souls. And that also has to be purified to where it's God is the only focus. Okay. Once uh, in the spiritual life, once we've undergone the process of removing all of our attachments, there's two stages that you have to go through in that process. The first is the active period of way. You have to do everything you can to purge yourself of all of the attachments that you have, which comes through the process of doing everything you can to develop natural virtue, etc. But our attachments are so deeply rooted, even especially in relationship to the self, that God's got to go in there and start ripping them out through the passive purgation, right? So it's a twofold thing. So in order to do that, <clears throat> once all our attachments are removed, now remember I said that the attachments can affect our judgment. It means that our attachments are the principles of what we use to judge what we should and should not do. I, most people do things throughout the course of the day based upon their attachments in relationship to certain things. And once that's stripped of the person, they can be a bit lost because the principles of their judgment are gone and they don't have anything to determine what am I supposed to do now, okay? And John of the Cross comes back and he says two things. He primarily talks about faith. He says, Faith, once you've stripped your principle of judgment from you, you don't know what to judge. You're dark. You're entering the dark night. He says, so as a result, you need to use faith to continue to understand what you need to do. Because faith teaches us these are the things you need to do to have union with God. So you can continue advancing, knowing what to do through faith. <clears throat> but you also need motivation to continue pursuing that. And that's why hope and charity are part of it, but primarily charity. Charity motivates me to continue moving down the process once I've stripped myself of all the attachments. And even in my spiritual life, once I've stripped myself of all the attachments in relationship to my spiritual life, 
you can go through this, a person can go through this process where you lose your motivation even in spiritual matters. And so you need a different motivation and that has to be charity, it has to be God to begin to continue propelling yourself down that road. So attachment, detachment is the precursor to perfect charity, which we mentioned. Okay, next. So we, can, we see now the finality of attack, detachment. Okay, so what are the reasons for detachment? From creatures, for perfect union with God, as stated St. John of the Cross, can be summarized in this way. So this is what St. John of the Cross, if you summarize what he said. First of all, God, it, God is everything. God is all, ultimately. The necessary and absolute being, most pure act without shadow of potency, who exists of himself and possesses the absolute plenitude of being. He is goodness itself. Goodness itself. For us to pursue anything other than him, in the end, isn't really rational. Because it's analogous to a guy not being interested in his wife, but absolutely loving her picture. Doesn't make any sense, right? Something that's in the image, right? What we should really be doing is that he should be interested in his wife, not the picture. Or in the picture only insofar as it gets a reflection of his wife. So, because he is goodness itself, and everything else is only good because it participates in his goodness in some way, once we recognize that, our real focus should be him then. He should be everything. And that in the end, creatures are absolutely nothing without him. So, it's all about him. So, that means then, the two... Con it's a, uh, so, when you look at St. John of the Cross, two contraries cannot exist in the same subject at the same time. Because they mutually exclude each other. So, either the person will see that the creatures are nothing and it's only God, or their focus will become the creatures in the end and not God. Now, in per you're either going to have to detach either in this life or the next. Nobody in heaven has any attachment to any creature whatsoever, their attachment is to God alone. So you're at this stage where you have these attachments. You have to get from here to there if you're going to be in heaven. And there's got to be, there's a medium point here. Now you can either do it in this life or you can do it in purgatory. So in order to ascend to God, in order to approach him, you must go through the process of getting rid of this other contrary. St. Thomas has this fantastic line. He says, confusion is the result of two contraries at the, in the mind at the same time. So I always tell people, you're confused, okay, we've got to eliminate one of the contraries. We've got to figure out which one of these isn't true, get rid of it, and then you'll, you'll, the, what remains is, is the truth, right? Well, it's the same thing even in relationship to God. Most people, I think, are confused in their spiritual life in the sense that they don't really pursue, they don't really pursue God with their whole heart. All vices, sins, and imperfections arise out of attachments or if it's a vice, or if it's an imperfection, it is an attachment. You just got to get rid of it. So all the sins, everything usually arise out of some kind of an attachment to something. One of the things I've learned in dealing with demons is, at the moment of their creation, God showed them their task, but then in the context of that task was, an, was some other end created good that was connected to it in some manner because of the nature of the thing. And so in the process of choosing to follow God's task, it meant they had to perform the act of sacrifice in which this other ancillary good, which they could pursue, has to be let loose of and sacrificed to God and that the, person, that the, the angel focused and accepted his task, which meant he had to do this to the exclusion of that good. The nature of sacrifice is to take something good and place it on God and, and basically let loose of it, right? Mm -hmm. So that they either had to uh, perform an act of sacrifice, which integrally had an act of detachment from it, or they chose, because remember beforehand, they didn't have any attachments, or they, they chose to attach their will to this thing. Now with them, that's a one-shot deal. So once they attach their will to this thing, it's permanent. So in hell, everybody suffers from attachments. In heaven, nobody has any attachments. And that's the dividing line. Okay? But they chose to become attached to this. 
Attachments obviously have an impact on discerning God's will. Grace is very subtle in the intellect and will, but if you're if your intellect and will being drug all over the place because of your attachments, you're not going to be able to discern God's will very clearly. So you've got to work on the detachments. And this means that you have to work on trying to conform yourself to it. So, uh, this also means there has to be a kind of, uh, if you're going to be detached, there has to be a certain self-sacrifice in the process. You have to realize that you're just not in the center of the universe, which I've talked about, but you also have to be willing to lay your good at God's feet and just say, there it is. You do with what you want with it. And that in the end, if he decides to never use it or gut it, then that's his choice. And that's one of the things that we, even in relationship to ourselves, how he uses us. You can have attachments even to specific crosses in life. So, then, we have to basically be able to abandon ourselves to what God chooses. And that can only be done, that there has to be a self-abandonment. Part of detachment is letting loose of things. Because we tend to grab onto things to make ourselves feel secure, to make ourselves feel okay, or whatever the case is, we have to be able to let loose of that in order to just let God do what he wants with us. So, to have perfect detachment, you need charity, obviously. You need fear of the Lord. You need the virtue of religion, specifically sacrifice. In other words, you have to be willing to carry the cross that he gives you. That has to be a self-abandonment. You also have to be willing to be wounded, which we've talked about in the past in relationship to all that. You have to be willing to be gutted in a certain sense. Right? So, okay. Any questions? Catherine looks like she's just dying to ask a question. <laughs> and Nicholas, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the aspects of temperance that St. Thomas says you can be intemperate when you eat when you're not supposed to. Let me give you an example. Uh, we don't see that with among the boys here, but you do see it from time to time, especially in families that have a lot of boys. The minute the mother puts the food out, she hasn't even got the food completely out, and the kids are digging into the food, right? And now is not the time. So if you have perfect detachment, you can wait until the time is right to eat. In our culture, we have a general custom which reflects that, which is when the food is prepared and handed to people, like in a restaurant, it's your, you should be waiting. In Europe, they don't do it because it's a different reason. But here, you're supposed to wait until everybody gets their food before you eat, right? So there should be a detachment on the side of the appetite to be able to take or leave when you eat the food, if you eat the food, or what have you. So if someone puts the steak down, and then later comes along and says, oh, no, that's not yours, and then they hand you, you know, raw tomatoes, but there shouldn't be any reaction at all at the level of the appetites. So, and that's basically what, and that also though, but I think St. Thomas is right, that basically what that means is temperance is multifaceted. You know, you don't eat too greedily, you don't eat too quickly, you don't you eat when you're supposed to eat, right? You don't eat too daintily, etc. There's all these things that govern that um, in relationship to the detachment. So if you have that detachment, people will just naturally kind of do that. So, um, the point being is, is that if you're really hungry, your lower faculties can be desiring to be filled with food, but it doesn't mean that you have to have this food. So, I, once in a while, I'll make the joke, I'll tell people, are you hungry? Yeah, I'm starving. What do you want to eat? And I'm like, I don't know, my appetites aren't telling me what I want. Right? So, in other words, that people say, well, what do you think we should do? I said, I don't know, I'm confused. My appetites aren't telling me. Right? So, but the point being is, is that you get to the point where the appetite is indifferent to what's placed in front of you. And there shouldn't be any upsetness or anything regardless of what is placed before you. Um, and so there shouldn't be any emotional attachment to it. It doesn't mean you're not hungry, you don't want to eat. It just means you don't have to eat 
this thing. You don't have to eat it now, right? So, okay, yeah. I can see that clearly, but if it comes to talking towards you, you're <laughs> your library. <laughs> I mean, even if, even if you don't have emotional reactions, which I can't imagine anybody, but um, intellectually, <laughs> something like that deserves me. Well, let me, let me tell you a, uh, a, a story about, I mean, some of you have heard this story. When I first moved to Tulsa, this was in September. I get down there in July, beginning of July, I think. It was in August. I get down there and I start working. And my sister says she wants my computer. I said, okay, you can have it. I'll just get a different one. So, but I needed the hard drives out of the old one because they were bigger and they were faster. And I told her, yeah, I'll take the ones out of the new computer and put it in here. So in the process of switching it, of those, uh, I call it the Gates factory, but the originals and all the backups of all the work I had done for 25 years was wiped out. Oh. Full. No. Virtually none of it was recoverable. Okay. At the time it happened, I got, I'm like, oh man, that's annoying. And I wasn't mad at the fact that I had lost the stuff. What I was irritated is, is that that meant, back to this thing, that means it's going to take my time, which I'm very, I was very attached to. That's going to take my time, which that's what annoyed me, right? Mm -hmm. So then the next day, I'm saying Mass, and I'm reading the Gospel, and then the thought occurs to me, because you get all sorts of strange thoughts while you're saying Mass, but this one just kind of popped in, and the thought was, obviously, God doesn't have the same estimation of your work that you do. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, if he did, he would have preserved it, right? So, as a result of that, I, uh, you know, I kind of chuckled a little under my breath, and I just continued with Mass, right? And from that point on, there was, there's a certain detachment. I mean, there's stuff I would have liked to have recovered out of that, but um, it doesn't kill me, you know, and I just spent the time rebuilding the files that I needed. The rest of it, I just said, well, God doesn't see the need for me to have this. But there has to be a certain level of detachment. What it taught me was, is that my attachment wasn't to those things specifically. My attachment was to my time. And so that's what I had to start working on. Yes? When is there an appropriate uh, time? Well, what happens is, is if there's something that is unjust, there's no antecedent emotion of anger. What happens is, is reason recognizes that this particular injustice that's happened, there should be this emotion proportionate to it. So it's both in relationship to the object, legitimate object of, in, of injustice, but at the same time, it's moderated according to degree. So there, and there's no antecedent appetite. So that's when you know. Reason recognizes the injustice and moves accordingly. Whereas most of us, I mean, the minute you get something happens, you get really angry, and your judgment tends to go to extreme. I mean, every person has experienced that thing where they got angry and then afterwards realize, okay, I went better. You know, I said something when I shouldn't have said it because it really, you know, my judgment was to excess. So, yeah. But in, in some cases, isn't it even wrong to not get indignant? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So anger in, its, anger in itself is not necessarily bad unless it falls upon the wrong object or it's immoderate. It's imperfect if it's antecedent, even if it's good. So, yes? I was wondering about the supernatural uh, For example, with the sacraments or with the religious, who is trying to stay very close to the rule of the Constitution. Yes. You have to have detachment even from those. How does that work? How does that work? It means that you see them purely as a means and not as an end. So, if I was looking at, for example, I can go to Mass today, I'll please God by your hands, I go to Mass, but another day there is a time when God doesn't have to go to Mass. That's not. That's that. Yes, exactly. So you would be emotionally or antecedent of the appetites or the, 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 if you didn't have the attachments and you're 
desires to do only God's will, when his will shifts around based upon circumstances, it doesn't bother you. So, and which is one of the important because one of the things in most most convents and societies that are under a rule, there are certain times when the rule doesn't always apply, and you can tell when people have an attachment to the rule. Uh, by rule apply, I mean in the sense that there might be a particular instance that arises, and so they have to kind of set aside the regimen in order to do something right. The people who get upset at that, who don't want any changes, that's a sign you have an attachment to that. Rather than seeing the rule as a means, it's a means to your sanctification. And so there needs to be detachment. doesn't mean that you don't follow it with exactitude, but it's because charity moves you to do that, not your attachment to it. Yes? It seems like it would be rooted also in a sort of fear of like legalistic people tend to have a fear of like, I don't know if that makes any sense, but like it's some sort of slipping in a sense of it's a reflection on them, or like they won't get something out of, I don't know if that, you know, really sure how it's Could you explain a little differently maybe? Well, like a lot of times people who are legalistic are afraid of slipping for the sake of how it would reflect on themselves in their yes. own estimation, not necessarily in the estimation of others. Yes. But. <coughs> well, you know, that, that's absolutely correct, actually. In the end, the detachment has to be even from what other people think of you, whether they, they think you're violating the law or not. It also has to do with detachments have to be most, when you hear people's general confessions, most people over the age of 25 have something in their past that they regret. And what that's a sign of, and by most, I mean like a vast majority, rarely do you come across somebody who's over the age of 25 says, no, Father, I had a pretty good life and I don't have any regrets. So, you're like, wow, okay. But that, that was a very <laughs> rare. And so the, uh, the point being is, is that usually there's an attachment to something. And usually that attachment is to wanting to have been perfect or wanting to not have done that. And so there has to be a detachment even in relationship to those things. So um, because a lot of times our attachments are to our own self-perceptions, you're right. When re really, if we're detached, we just say, well, this is me without grace, right? This is what I'll do. Yes? Can you, so, I guess you can have an attachment to looking back on your past and regretting it. You can like regretting it too yes. much and, and that. Which is a sign you're attached to something in there. If you keep thinking about it in the past, that means there's something about it that you're attached to. You know, I wish this wouldn't have happened. I wish this, well... Yeah, we, we, you, wish, you may not wish that it happened, but it should be because God's offended, not because it made you look bad. That's the real key, I think. So, any other questions? Yeah, I think part of that is that's why you have a spiritual director to some degree. But I think some of it is, too, is, is that um, there can kind of be this mindset. Um, there can be attachments even to completing the prayers. And what that attachment is, it's self-satisfaction. Okay. It's not about God getting what he wants. Because if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing at each and every moment... There might be certain prayers you're just not going to get to during that day, and there shouldn't be any self satisfaction you know. And so, I'm not, by the way, I'm not trying to suggest that you shouldn't strive to do your prayers, etc., but what I'm saying is that sometimes people can kind of start using that as a standard of judgment about where they're at in their spiritual life rather than, well, wait a minute, am I detached from these prayers? Am I, am I detached from the fluidity of my life depending on what God wants for me in that particular moment? So one of the things that happened to me recently is I'm in New York, I get this phone call, I gotta fly to Mexico City, right? Now, what I really wanted to do is go back home, but there has to be that fluidity means that when God has full control of your life, you just don't get to do what you wanna do. And part of that is, 
even though your prayer life will be fairly consistent as far as the vocal prayers, and pray, but in the end, what he really wants is just your attention on him. So, and the prayers are the means to that to some degree. Prayer is a means to union with God, and we have to kind of recognize that. And there's different means. I think, but I, like I said, the other thing is too is, is I think there's also can be sometimes that people build in their mind this is what a saint is, right? And then they they start doing those things, and so they're trying to measure themselves against this standard that they have, rather than what what should be the standard. There's only one standard, just one. Do you love God with everything in your being? That's the only standard. Everything else is fluid in relationship to that based upon your state in life. And I think the problem is, is that people get too hung up on the standards in relationship to that or the, the things in relationship to that rather than that one standard. Mm -hmm. But it is right to kind of try to order that. Oh, yeah. You have to order it. But that's, again, the order is a means to the end. Right, right. But you just can't become attached even to the order, right? Yeah. So when things are a little bit disordered, you just have to be able to, it shouldn't affect you. Yeah. How do you do that when maybe you're going about certain things in the right way objectively as far as maybe your prayer life or whatnot or certain habituations, but if your intention has been off, how do you, like if your intention was maybe to please yourself or something like that, how do you rectify that, mortify that intention without dropping certain things that maybe you should maintain? Or is there, you know, like, Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, there would be two things. One, if you have a spiritual director or a confessor who knows you, submit it to him and say, what should I do? So that there's that kind of dying to self in relationship to those. But I think the other part of it is um, that maybe this will be helpful. St. Thomas says that to do everything purely for the will of God, purely because of him, is only the hallmark of a person who has reached perfection, the state of the perfect at the end. Mm -hmm. John of the Cross says it's only the hallmark of the person who has reached transforming union which means it's a process. And so we have to recognize it's a process and work on it. And it means it's a habit. So you have to get into the habit of doing it. And part of that is, um, you know, just working on that love of God throughout the course of the day on regular intervals. But some of it is too, is just from time to time, bring it back. But it also means that you can't get to that point to do everything for the love of God. There's two kinds of love. There's what we call interested love. And the authors say that Human beings can attain this interested love of God on their own. I can love God because he gives me all sorts of goodies. You know, you hear this among the Protestants. I love God because God gave me my Cadillac and my house. And my, you know, by the time it's done, you're just like, yeah, really what you love is a Cadillac and a house. <laughs> all right. But it's because you're getting, you're, and he's, they say we can attain this on our own, this interested love, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's what we call disinterested love. So in, in the end, the interested love is really about the self, right? When disinterested love, disinterested love, that one is only about God alone. And they say this is impossible for us to attain on our own natural capacities. That's why I keep telling certain people, look, to make this transition from this interested love to the disinterested love, first thing you have to do is get rid of all attachments. Because that's what's stripping yourself of your self-interest, is getting rid of your attachments. But then you're going to reach a certain stage once that happens where you're going to plateau out. You have reached as far as your natural faculties can be the cause. Because we're not perfect, we can't make ourselves perfect. We're limited, so we can't attain the unlimited, which is God. And that means that there's at that stage in making that transition, you have to switch to a position where God takes over. You're no longer the one in control of your spiritual life. And that only happens when you've stripped yourself of all the attachments. And that, and, but you can start that process where you just tell God, okay, this, you're the one who, in a certain sense, it's his responsibility to perfect me, not mine. Now, Christ said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. How do we do that? By cooperating, you have to take a position of cooperation with his activity in you. It's not about you rendering yourself perfect. This is one of the real problems with people who you kind of start saying, do you have to tear yourself? No. Do you beat yourself up? Yeah. Why? And really at the root of it is, is this mindset that if I just flagellate myself enough and beat myself up enough, I will render myself into a state of perfection before God. That's absurd. You can't do that. 
You can't make yourself perfect. You're not perfect. You don't have. You can't give what you don't have, right? That means that God has to take over at a certain stage. And the sooner you let him do it, the better off you are. So that's when you have to take the position of, okay, God, you just purify me. And that means every time a grace comes, you have to have that brutal fidelity to grace. The se- and you have to even ask him for that fidelity to the grace. The second thing you have to do is you have to be willing. So you have to have that uh, fidelity to grace. But you also have to re- cede that perfect control to him. And so when he sends you sufferings, you have to embrace them. You just have to embrace them. Humiliations, all of that. All that has to just be embraced every time it comes because he's the one that's providing the means. Those are the means by which you're going to be purified. But that means you have to pres- uh, assume a position of, of cooperation rather than trying to control. And that takes time. It takes time to master that. And you can't even do that without him helping you to do that. So the point being is, is that in your, when you're trying to get those things ordered, one is to surrender things to externally to a, to a director or something who can start to help you to order things. But then at a certain stage, you just have to assume that position where Christ is the one purifying me. Mm-hmm. And the one that is making, that's why it's called passive purgation. Mm-hmm. You have to get to the point where he's the one doing it, not you. So, um, and then he illuminates your mind. He's the one who causes the union. Which, by the way, there was a theological error in this prayer, one of these prayers. I was reading, I'm like, oh, that's not right. Our Lady did not, un- her soul did not unify itself with God. God unified himself with her soul. So there's a difference in that uh, thing. But um, I'll just blot it out in the book. Okay. Where was it? Blot out my iniquities, says the book. What's that? Blot out my iniquities. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Okay. Any other questions? All right, if you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis patris et filii et spiritus sancti super vos et maniat semper. Amen.